Welcome everyone. In this video, we're going to talk about the main sources of variability in the EEG data, the main steps for separating signal and noise, and the core descriptors of the EEG signal. These different aspects of the EEG are the main features of information for both univariate and multivariate analysis. First, we'll go over the need to separate signal from noise in the EEG, and afterwards, We'll focus on the frequency, amplitude, and phase of the oscillations that are at the basis of this complex signal. When we think of the EEG signal in its idealized form, we may see something like this image, where all the EEG channels offer a clean and uniform oscillatory activity. However, when we collect actual EEG, we may end up with something more similar to this packed image, where there seems to be actual data, but also other sources of variability. This is because the EEG is a mixture of actual neural electrophysiological activity and noise coming from the participant and external sources in the laboratory. Typical sources of internal noise are eye blink up movements and electricity coming from the power line is an external one. So before we can start analyzing our data, either with uni- or multivariate analysis, we need to first clean the signal. EEG preprocessing is related to this cleaning of the signal. But acquiring the cleanest data to begin with is at least as important as doing a good job cleaning the data. Noise increases several variability in the data, which reduces statistical power. Noise also leads to the rejection of bad trial, which decreases the number of observations. A having, having a large number of observations is essential for later analysis. Because of this, overall noise decreases statistical power and the quality of the results. Signal preprocessing has among its goal to clean the data from noise and also other sources of variability and prepares it for later analysis. However, preprocessing does not fully remove all the noise, and some steps in it, such as filtering, can uh, distort the data. So, imagine that you could be Fry coming back from the future to warn you. When you're collecting data for your experiments, keep your participants as happy as possible. First, because happiness is good, but also because a happy participant gives happy data, and this usually means better quality data. Make sure that they understand the task that they're doing and spend all the time needed until their performance reaches the desired levels. Um, and also taking into account that many tasks that we do are usually not very fun and they are very long, you need to keep them awake, engaged and awake. If your participant doesn't really understand the task that they're supposed to do, of this, or if they spend the whole recording in light sleep, no matter how good your preprocessing or how fancy your multivariate analysis, the results are not going to be close enough. And even if during data acquisition this uh, seems like such a bore, you need to pay close attention and effort to place the electrodes correctly and to reduce the electrode impedances to obtain the cleanest signal possible. Once we have collected the data uh, as clean as possible, there are several preprocessing steps. There is some degree of variability in the order in which these steps are applied, and uses are different across labs. For the practical exercises in this course, we are going to follow a specific order, which I'm about to mention only very briefly now, as it will be treated in more detail during a practical session. There are a series of transformations that we apply before ICA, or independent component analysis, and others that we follow this. After collecting highly sampled data, for example at 1 Hz, it is common to downsample it to reduce the size of the file and also the computational load for later analysis. Channels that are bad during the significant part of the recording are eliminated and data may be filtered out or not, depending on the research questions and analysis to be applied, and also on the initial quality of the recording. Afterwards, the continuous EEG is segmented into epochs that contain the events of interest in the experimental design. At this point, an ICA is performed on the data, which allows to extract noise-related components. These will be detected and removed, generating a signal without contamination from eye blinks and similar noise. 
trails with high levels of other sources of noise are also removed, and bad channels are interpolated. Finally, data is with reference to the average signal from on the channels and are visually inspected to make sure that the final result is as clean as possible. Note that trial averaging, which is a required step for event-related potential analysis, is not a necessary prerequisite for multivariate analysis. This may or may not be done depending on the specific analysis performed, as we will see later on the course. Now, with a clean signal, we can do whatever analysis we have planned and interpret them according to the theory and hypothesis being tested. So, after this short overview on signal preprocessing, we're going to go over the descriptors of the EG signal. Multivariate analysis present a highly flexible approach, and this in part means that it is feasible to apply them to different features of the complex EEG signal. As you all know, the EEG reflects oscillations in voltage over time across different electrodes. These oscillations are rhythmic fluctuations of a signal that reflect different states of a system. The oscillations that we observe in the EEG are related to the underlying neural fluctuations in large coalitions of neurons that undergo up and down states of different levels of excitability. The figure reflects how interactions between excitatory and inhibitory neurons can produce oscillations, shown above as the spikes of neurons and below as the oscillatory activity of the network in a 50 Hz cycle. Oscillations are, according to several theories, a powerful means to regulate the flow of information and selection of activity in brain networks. The relative phases of excitability of different networks would dictate whether information reaches a region during an excitable or non-excitable window of the, of the oscillations, which in turn would determine whether the message has an influence on the target population or not. In these two images, you can see how the target region in the middle is being influenced by the activity from the top region, because this message arrives during the peak of excitability. In contrast, its activity is not being driven by the information from the bottom population in the graph, as this one arrives during a non-excitable window. So, EG oscillations can be characterized by their frequency, their amplitude or power, and the phase of the oscillations. And these can be studied across time and the sensors where the signal is measured or at the level of the source estimated to be the origin of the signal. The frequency of an oscillation refers to its speed, that is, the number of oscillations or cycles that take place in a second, which is measured in hertz. The range of oscillations that we observe in the human EEG has been traditionally classified into frequency bands of different speeds, from slow delta waves to fast gamma. Even though dividing the EEG into distinct frequency bands has proved very useful to study human brain activity, it's always good to keep in mind that at any given time in the brain, there are many different computations operating at the same time at different oscillatory speeds. Rhythms are not specific of single cognitive computations, but can have different roles depending on task context and the brain regions involved. EEG is also characterized by its amplitude or power, which is simply the energy of the oscillation, or height of the wave. Amplitude corresponds to the square root of the power, and so they are easily, easily exchanged. We usually employ the term amplitude when we describe voltage in the raw EEG or in event-related potentials, whereas the term power is used in frequency analysis to describe the energy or amount of specific frequencies that compose the signal in a time interval. You can see in the graph how an oscillation of a constant frequency happens in time, whereas its power changes, as reflected in the power time series decline. An additional important descriptor of the state of a system is the phase of its oscillations. The phase relates to the position along the cycle of an oscillation. In neural terms, the phase relates to the up or down state of the system. 
you can see in the graph how a phase can be displayed in wave diagrams or equivalent polar coordinates, and how the different phases being lighted up correspond to different phases of the, oscill of the oscillation in both notation systems. In a simpler manner, the up and down peaks uh, of an oscillations are often referred to as peaks and troughs. The phase of oscillations is quite relevant in terms of explaining how the brain works. As phase relates to the specific state that a certain oscillation is, they are a crucial part influencing the communication of information between brain systems and information coding. For example, the coherence in the oscillations of two systems relate to the relative phases. Also, there is extensive literature investigating how the phase of a slow rhythm in which neurons fire seem to be a mechanistic for coding and organizing information in the brain. The theta gamma cos frequency coupling phenomena observed in the hippocampus of rats and humans is a really good example of this. So, wrapping up with a few take-home messages from this video. First, remember that acquiring the, cli the cleanest signal possible is the first essential step to a great experiment. To describe the EEG data, we rely on frequency, amplitude or power, and phase of the signal. These char characteristics or features are the main sources for univariate and multivariate analysis of the EEG, which also take into account time and the sensors recording the signal and sometimes also the source generating it. To finalize, here you have some more readings and other resources if you want to extend your knowledge of the topics covered in this video.